Well, there's... Come on, Eileen. I'm just kidding. Hey, Mike Henry here. Here with my good friend Aaron Lee, who we uh, used to work together on The Cleveland Show and maybe a little family guy and a lot of, uh, you know, Hollywood partying, uh, drinking a soda and uh, smoking a camel. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, speaking of camel, camel toe, you were once uh, the editor <laughs> Of uh, comedy of for Hus- magazine of Hustler yes. magazine, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, well, I was not the editor of Hustler magazine. It, was, it wasn't. I mean, it, it's a team effort to make a, a pornographic magazine. Mike. Okay, it's, okay. Uh, yeah, I can't. I can't take all the credit. Like, okay, that's ridiculous. Yeah, that's it needs crazy. to be spread around on a on a magazine like that. Emphasis on spread. Yes, yeah, that's and, for sure. And yes. round. I don't know some <laughs> yeah. shit. Anyway, we have a good time goofing <laughs> off and. Uh, Thought Aaron would be a great guy to come in and just chat and just talk about shit. We're going to talk about comedy. We'll talk mm. about life. Oh, um, I like both those topics. I do too. That's I do great. Too. So, all right. So, I just moved back to LA. You, you've been. When did you? When did you move to LA? And where did you come from? Uh, well, let's see. I was born in upstate New York. At age ten, I moved to Kentucky, to Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, following my uh my crazy ass uh stoner dad <laughs> mm-hmm. who uh moved to lexington to uh work in children's theater he was he, he was a, he was a wild man okay. moved us to uh moved us to an all black neighborhood so he could follow his dreams of children's theater in the south okay, okay. and um uh and then uh when i was uh around like 20 years old I was I was uh, very into punk rock, and I was in a band uh, called Penis Your Majesty. Penis Your Majesty. Penis Your Majesty. <laughs> we had one album which was titled uh, "There's a Phallus in the Palace," and uh, and we would wear. Uh, you know, we'd wear costumes and we'd throw up on stage. That was one of our big gimmicks. Was this an uh, ep- epicac induced, or you just uh, could make yourself throw? up? Yeah, make, make ourselves throw up. Just drink a lot of beer. Like that's what I sure. think of when you're young. Actually, and a lot up. of milk because visually that would show up more. Yes, I yeah. get it. Yep, I get what the milk was supposed to be. <laughs> well, come. <laughs> well, maybe we got uh we got our show shut down by the police once because uh, we did an all ages show. And a friend of ours got up on stage, took all his clothes off, and put an egg up his ass. Oh. And uh, the uh, the club uh, called the police, and it was shut down. Okay. So this was, this was crazy, wild and crazy stuff to be doing in Kentucky. Yeah. Which I think is why you and I bonded so much, Mike, when I met you, because you were doing crazy shit in Virginia. I Yeah, I grew up in Virginia, and yeah, I, I always sort of... You know, just had general family dysfunction, and that gave me my view of the world. But I just couldn't stand the status quo and how everyone just does what is expected, and you go through school, and then you get a job, and then you whatever the fuck. And the commercials, the commercials got me the most because that's what everyone <laughs> was taking in back in. There's still that's still happening, but back in the day when there were three networks, you'd get your schlock programming and then you'd get your schlock commercials and i'd be like this is stupid mm-hmm. you know they're 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 doing something with us so i started making fake commercials and and doing things like that but you didn't have a punk rock face right i did not have a punk rock face yeah. I'm, I'm more of a sort of a stoner i liked you know grateful dead and u2 is actually about my favorite band we just saw them uh my wife and i sarah just uh saw them at the sphere in vegas which was absolutely phenomenal that's so, great and um, and did they all throw up and did a guy stick an egg up his ass i mean the, the kind of things that happen in a rock performance those things probably happened i didn't see them right um but you know they could have happened um you, you know what's funny can was it a hard show... it was a hard-boiled egg right it was hard boiled. Okay. thank god all right um can we show this headshot of yours over yes, here absolutely so here's, yeah here's what i think is funny because i saw this when i came in Check out this guy. You were, you are, and were a good-looking guy. Thank you, Aaron. So you, I mean, look at what a handsome guy this is. Yeah. So it's funny to me because I'm not that good-looking. I wasn't then, so I had to do crazy punk rock shit. To get laid. Well, no one was getting laid out of that, believe me. Or an egg up your ass. <laughs> yes. But you could 
kind of be like one of the guys in the commercial. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? I acted you in look commercials. like you've got the look of a guy in yeah. a, you know, y- yeah. I acted in commercials. When I moved to L.A., I took a, a, a commercial acting workshop. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they basically taught you nothing other than how to put a stick of gum in your mouth so it folds a couple of times and also just <laughs> told you to basically act like you knew what you were doing. Did which... you injure yourself doing that at any point? And they were like, no, no, Mike, like this. No. Here, put the gum in. Okay. No, yeah. I thought, I, me being me, counterculture, I tried to put the gum up my ass. Sure, and, right. you know. The police came. They shut down the... That's yeah. right. Yeah, no, I know what happens. We all have our yeah, stories. I've been there. But... <laughs> I uh, I used to do commercial uh, auditions and stuff too, and I would and I booked a bunch of commercials. And I wonder if this happened with you. I would get them because I was good at improv. Mm. I was as long as you were asked to be funny to, to improv, I would I'd book it. Right. If I was if I but I didn't know how to act at all. Right. If you had to read lines, then you were <laughs> it's fucked. Terrible. All right. And the first commercial I booked it was for. Um, where I really had to act was for round table pizza. Okay. And this whole, this whole shoot is set up and I'm in the car and the director is like, okay, now look like you're kind of concerned about what's going on. I was like, I don't know how to look concerned. Right. I know. And they, and it was a nightmare. Like the whole shoot was a total disaster because I realized like, I don't know how to act. You know who I blame? Who? Ultimately the client. Cause they paid for it. But yeah. the director. Yeah. He should have made you, the director could have said, ah, I stepped on my dick. And you'd be like, <laughs> then he would have had right. what he needed. Kind of like the way you get reactions out of a, a dog or a horse. Yeah. Like, yeah. He should yeah. have treated treat. me like that. Should yes. have had a treat or whistled. You're a good director. I can tell that. Well, you know. Ah, I stepped I, on my dick. Didn't right. Alfred Hitchcock use that in the shower scene to get the reaction out of Janet Lee? Yeah, Hitchcock. Yeah. yeah. So I bet you were good in commercial auditions. Uh once in a while. I, I actually booked, when I lived in New York, I booked a Foot Locker commercial that ran all during the basketball playoffs. Oh, yeah. Which was a huge boost for me because I was probably six, seven years into my creative journey of trying to be funny for a living. Mm-hmm. And I was broke and everything else. And, and this was back there. This was in New York. I, I oh, was in New York. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. I, I had lived in L.A. for a few years in my mid-20s when I took that groovy headshot. Mm-hmm. And then I uh, went back to Virginia and I shot a bunch of shorts and commercial parodies. And then I moved to New York. And uh, it was there that I was, I was actually getting fairly close to SNL, probably about oh a year God. away from a real legit shot at a, a, a meaningful audition when Seth called. And I had met Seth along the way. And Seth said, hey, that uh, that show, I sold it. Family Guy, do you want to move to L.A.? And so I did. Wow. Yeah. So there's, there, but there's a whole sliding doors thing where you could have been the SNL guy. I know. Who knows? You yeah. know, I, I think about that. I, I'd love to host it one day. That would be like cathartic for me. Yeah. I did yeah. something wonderful and, and notor- n- notable enough to, to do that. Yeah. But, you know. You, you can't look back. I'm happy now. But what, let me ask you this. What What do you think? What, let's say that it happened. Mm-hmm. What, what do you think your, you know, they always say, well, it's funny because they always have that saying, rejection is God's protection. Okay. But you didn't even get rejected. You, you made a different choice. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. like, what do you think you, who did you, who was your favorite on SNL? Who would you have, you must have thought like, I'll be that guy. You know, will you be the Phil Hartman? Will you be the... What, what do you think? Right. I would have to say it was probably... Um, uh, I'd have to go all the way back to, you know, Chevy Chase, yeah. Steve Martin, you know, when he would host. You know, th- those guys. I was looking for a funny joke there, and I, I didn't want to diss anybody because I don't know these people. <laughs> but um, Tim Kazarinsky, what you were just sure, going to Yeah, sure. right. Um, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, I set out I, when I, I quit my little advertising job at age 24, and my whole thing was I'm going to go be funny like Chevy and Steve, and wow. I'm going to be wacky like David Lynch, wild at heart. You can see the bottoms of those posters in your mm. frame there that hang proudly in my office. But um, yeah, I wanted to just go do something utterly different and mm-hmm. independent. And when it came time, you know, I was I was really gunning toward SNL. I did commercial parodies. I wanted to write and, and be in the stuff. And, 
you know, it, it just happened that I was able to get in on the ground floor of, of something. And I sort of recognized that. And I also recognized that I was flat broke. Right. And, um, so I came to LA and I was out of debt in six months off of my staff writer salary. Did you think it would work? When, 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 like, did you go in on the first day of Family Guy going, oh, I think this is going to be huge? I, I knew it was funny. And yeah. Seth was hilarious. I met Seth through Patrick, my brother, and they were friends in college. And I would, I would act in my brother's films, and I met this guy that he kept telling me about Seth, and we cracked each other up. So I would send him the shorts I was doing. He would send me animated stuff that he was doing, including, you know, I pitched a bunch of jokes for the pilot presentation of, of Family Guy. Right. So all I knew was it was funny. And luckily for me, I was eight years into my journey of comedy, doing auditions and writing and stand up and, you know, whatever else. And Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 right. hours. Yeah, right, I was right. right there. And so when I showed up in the Family Guy room, I was I was hitting right off the bat and it you know it, it and felt were, good. And did you come in did you come in with your characters? Was it like were any of them like you know what do they call that trunk characters like hey here's this right. guy I've been working on you, you know. No, I just always imitated people and you know like Herbert was based on an old man that I pushed groceries with in high school at an after school job and Among they also had a, a lot of uh <laughs> They had a lot of retired old men that would work a few hours just pushing groceries out. And I would just imitate this one man who sounded a little bit like Herbert. And mm-hmm. <clears throat> Come on now. Come on, let me help you squeeze those felons. <laughs> like, I need to warm up the voice. But, but basically, I, that guy was just a pervert. Like, he wanted to, to, to bang the housewives. <laughs> right. Um, but I put a twist in the Family Guy writer's room out of, you know, just on the spur of the moment, like a spark in a dry forest. He's a pedophile. So, right. you know. He took off. So I, I had germs of characters. Here's here's something weird I got to ask you. I always heard, and there's a part of me that can't believe this is true, but I always heard, I I thought I always kind of heard like you didn't necessarily like him being a pedophile. Is that right? Like I I thought I heard or did <laughs> what you? Is there not to lie. I, <laughs> no. Uh, I, I always heard like it got kind of pushed in that direction that well, maybe you were a little uncomfortable with. We that. started getting fan mail from people in prison, oh, like God. locked up pedophiles. So that you know well, I'm like what the fuck you know. But yeah. all I can do it is feels put, so good to be seen. Thank I, you, Mike Henry. Pre- <laughs> like of, representation is so of, important. Yeah. yeah. But oh my hey, God. All I can do is put my art out into the world. I can't control sure. what happens after that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that that's a little creepy. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's a I used joke. to get a lot of mail <clears throat> I used to get a lot of mail from uh guys in prison when I worked at Hustler. Especially when one of my jobs was writing the fake letters. Oh so okay. so wait, what? Yeah, I the, know the, the letters know. were fake? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm like 20, 21 years old. I'd I'd be out, you know, partying all night the night before. I'd get up at like 7 a.m. Like a guy, like, oh, my God, I forgot to do the letters. I'd have to write right. these things. Cleaning like, uh, milk off your, <laughs> yes. your laundry. <laughs> like, a, and, yeah. like a kid that didn't do his homework assignment. I'd go in like frantically, just not just stream of consciousness, just, you know. And then these prisoners would write. Like I'd I'd write a letter like the girl would be like, uh, I'm I'm 18 years old and uh, I don't know I had sex on a roller coaster with a guy and and prisoners would write in like I want the address of that bitch who had sex with the guy on the roller coaster <laughs> like I'm gonna find her <laughs> it was like there were these terrifying letters that's you know? hilarious yeah yeah they took it very seriously they yeah. took it very seriously well yeah. you know. The saddest part about the saddest tale I've heard of your hustler experience was how much the uh, what was it called the beaver shots the oh God. stuff that the women would send in pictures yes. of themselves that, like the amateur and this yes. is back before internet and you know right. this is where you could be seen hustler <laughs> yes. magazine right right so yeah you, so what was it that you, you they would send in uh, they pictures send in of polaroids and and you know and you see this now on the internet like. <laughs> they'd send in Polaroids and it'd be like them, these amateur nude photos. And there's their toddler in the background, you know, in the playpen. But then there's, they, would, they would, the ones that you selected would get paid how much? Oh God. What, what was like 50 bucks? I think <laughs> that was, was like the 50 bucks in an me. issue with the magazine. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. A framed copy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was sad. Yeah. Yeah. The worst part was when Larry said, 
I want to do a video version of this. What if people send videos in? Larry and, Flint. Yes, Larry Flint. And my job was like to go through these videos. Like, oh, it was so brutal. It was so, it was, it was really rough. Yeah, a lot really of, rough. A lot of milk spilled at the office. I would <laughs> yeah, say. I'm, a, um, I'm, I'm glad that's, uh, I'm glad that's in my past, Mike. Yeah, I gotta say. So then, how did you transition? Get it? Transition? Uh, yes. <laughs> Not really. How did you? <laughs> Go from uh, being a, a hustler comedy editor to a television writer. Well, <clears throat> um, and what year was this roughly? Uh, I this was the mid nineties, mid nineties okay. when I moved out here. Um, y- you know, I I had been I got that job because I while I'm in punk rock bands and stuff like that, I was also writing uh, a fanzine, a zine, a stapled Xeroxed little magazine mm-hmm. that was really just comedy writing. It was before it was before social media, it was before blogs even. So you would mail these things around. So I was doing comedy writing basically, and that is the kind of thing I wanted to do. I got, you know, that was my ticket out of here, uh, or ticket out to LA. You know, like I said, like living in Kentucky, growing up state New York, you know, I was like, like really like grew up on food stamps and poverty level. Like, you know, I think, uh, I think today being offered a job like that, it like that it, you'd probably think <laughs> twice a little bit more, but for me it was like, no, I'm just going to get out to Los Angeles and Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And once I got out here, I was like, I, I want to, I want to write movies. I want to perform. I want to do stand up. So I'd be sitting in my office at Hustler and, and I'd have my screenplay, you know, the, my comedy movie that I was writing furiously. And if my boss walked in and saw that screenplay for it, he'd flip the fuck out. So I would literally be furiously writing. He'd walk in and I'd have to lunge to put porn on the screen and he, uh, no joke. And he'd be like, what do you fucking do it? Right. I'm, I'm watching porn. I'm just, I'm just watching porn. <laughs> Are you are you lying? You working on some fucking screenplay? Man, all I've done all day is watch porn. I swear to God, you better be telling the truth. Like that, I love that, that. That really is, you know. So, and then uh, later, when I was the humor editor, once a week on Fridays, you would go to the studio and do like the photo funnies. So you, th- that week, Starship Troopers came out. So you would do a parody called Starship Poopers. And I like it, it. It was a lot of training for Family Guy and Cleveland show. Yeah. You know? Um, so, but while that, that shoot's going on, I'd be upstairs in like the dressing room practicing my stand up act for that night. You, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, so it was, it was all about like having this incredibly bizarre day job that, you know, <laughs> really fucked me up. It, it took years and years of therapy and shit too. Right. But it was, but it was all, yes. Like you're talking about growing up. It was all comedy obsession. It was yeah. all, I'm going to go to the open mic tonight. I'm going to. And then finally, from doing stand up, I met a uh, manager, Dave Rath, the great Dave Rath, who oh. was, he was like the alternative comedy guy at the time. Yeah. He had Pat Oswalt, Janine Garofalo, and all. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I met Dave, and he said, <laughs> he said, quit this nightmare job, <laughs> be broke. Mm-hmm. Uh, be broke for six months. You're going to be totally broke. Just write comedy all day. I'll be submitting you. It, it'll take six months tops, and I'll get you your first job. And and that is that's what happened. And the and the first job I got was at a comedy website. It was like the kind of dot com boom, you know. Mm-hmm. And then from there, he started giving me TV jobs and Comedy Central. Like roast. what kind of TV jobs? Well, well, back then, honestly, the first jobs he got me were all like. Um, MTV award shows, the MTV movie awards, mm-hmm. uh, VH1 would have some kind of award show and they were fun because they'd always, the MTV movie awards in particular always did their kind of parody movies, you know? Right. So not only were you, so not only was it fun because I'm going from, you know, working with Ron Jeremy to, to suddenly like Robert Downey Jr. is doing the sketch and Ben Stiller and you, you know, you just... You meet everyone for a couple Ron of Jeremy years. and Robert Downey Jr. have both done Family Guy. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Ron Jeremy came in, uh, I think it was season two, and it was around the holidays, so we had a lot of like holiday food out, and there was like a popcorn tin 
with cheese corn, caramel corn, oh. and plain corn. And so basically I felt obligated to put a warning sign that Ron, <laughs> Ron Jeremy's, Jeremy's hand this. had been in the caramel yeah. corn. Yeah, you should have just thrown that right out. Yeah, yeah. well, you know, <laughs> yeah. eat at your own risk, <laughs> yeah, as, yeah. as they say at Hustler. S- yeah, some people might like that at yeah. Family Guy. Some people might be excited. To, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, um, but it was not only was it like you get to, like, work with all these, like, big stars, but then the people uh, who were working alongside me, the, the writers... I mean, the the guy that produced those shows, his name was Joel Gallen. Yeah. And he had Huge. great... Yeah, he had he just had great... He, he hired so many good people. So I was working with, in the writer's room, with Andy Samberg and Will Forte and and uh, John Benjamin and, and just like, uh, just all great right. people. So, yeah. so it was awesome. And it was like boot camp for going into doing like more like the Comedy Central roast. And then I sold an animated show to MTV and get, getting into more of the kind of like, you know, yeah. sitcom comedy kind of stuff. So we met on the Cleveland show, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you came in. So that was what, 2008? eight or something i think that was two and, that was 2008 and i always remember that because we're doing one of the only you know shows with black characters on at the time mm-hmm. and it's animated so it's going to take like a year to produce and obama's running and we don't know <laughs> which way if we're going to go. have a black president right. by the time this comes on so so like you you're doing a, a a show with black characters and you can't say whether it was yeah but that's why i always remember 2008 that's interesting I, yeah yeah I, I remember that now that you're, you're yeah. talking about it but uh yeah so then then you turned me on to the celebrity roasts which are frankly those are the funniest things around i mean the the, the gloves are off and people are just... all in the past though can't do it anymore they keep trying to they keep it's you know it's just it's so i i don't know if they'll ever be able to do that again I really, I really do think it is, uh, it's of the past, you know. Because everyone's such a huge pussy now. <laughs> yes, pretty much. <laughs> you know, like when, you know, when Trump and Me Too hit. I remember right after that we did. Um, uh, oh God, was it? Justin oh, it was Bieber? Bruce Willis? Okay. No, that Justin Bieber was a funny one. Bruce Willis was right after that, and everybody was so tense and uptight. You, you know what I mean? And and it just and it was it was difficult because you either came out and you did a pretty tame set, mm-hmm. which wasn't that funny, or you were the person who got up and said, like, fuck all this uptight shit. I'm gonna say which just made people more tense, so that yeah. wasn't funny. Yeah. And then the Alec Baldwin one was after that, and that was you could tell people were loosening up. Yeah. And and people were more in the mood to laugh and um but then it just like I don't know they just they haven't done one since then I think yeah. it was just you know you know what it is the the jokes at those things when they're good is the jokes that you say with your friends because you know people and it's like you know if I'm with whoever black friends Hispanic friends <laughs> gay friends trans friends you know like whatever you're gonna give each other shit about your differences because that's what's funny but you know you all know where you're coming from that you're you're good right you know like so yes. I wish that that could translate and you know unfortunately just the way things are socially and you know it's not it only takes a couple people to be really upset about a joke to take the whole thing down and I think that's the you know that's that's what you're that's what the cause of all this is I think well I I have all sorts of different theories about it because like what you're describing among friends you're absolutely right but that's because you feel safe and that group of friends they feel safe with each other yeah and people in general after the past like six seven years no one feels safe no one feels safe anymore and so you can't have that we feel comfortable laughing in the room together at this um i think there's that i always thought i always thought too you know comedy is defined you hated the commercials on tv they were stupid it, comedy is defined and driven by opposition. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm making fun of this shit that's stupid. Once the most powerful man in the world is a roast comic mm-hmm. and a guy who was on the Comedy Central roast, it's yeah. that's not it's it's kind of hard to be subversive anymore in that way in the face of it. Right. You know what I mean? I always think that. I hear what you're saying, but I think, you know, 
truth in comedy is, you know, the, the, the comedy book and the <laughs> mantra of comedy truly. And that's why I hated the commercials because it's full of shit. They're trying to sell you something. So I like to make fun of that. Right. Or that's what I did. And I guess I did that a lot <laughs> on Family Guy. And I'll still, you know, I still want to do like you show some dumb fucking commercial and then cut to me going, <laughs> you know, like it's a fun, like it's fresh and it's fucking, who would have thought of that? You know, right, but, right. It just doesn't happen. So but I think the truth and maybe where I'm coming from is I feel like my truth is I don't have an agenda against everyone and I am trying to be empathetic or whatever. So I feel like I, I want to just be myself and make the jokes and, and you know, I love you kind of thing. Um, as opposed to the roast master Donald Trump, who is not, you know, <laughs> right. he's not coming from an authentic place. And, you know, he's, right. he's got an agenda and he's he's doing his thing. So, I, you know, I'd like to be able to, to, to do something that, that speaks to that at some point in a narrative. Truth form. is the funniest shit. That's the funniest thing. And and when we were doing those roasts, my my favorite writing trick like because okay the roast you would spend a month writing them you come in the first week it's very easy to write jokes you can very easily think of here's eight great William Shatner jokes week two you're like ugh, <laughs> kind of ran kind of running on fumes week three it's de desperate really like, okay. yeah it's like oh my god everybody's freaking out there's on there like and everybody's tired of the same four Shatner jokes and then week four, the week of the show, you would be in this incredible shape where where we would write like, you I know. feel like 75% and you're just talking and thinking in jokes and it's great. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's so fun. But when I would get stuck, when we talk about that, truth is the funniest thing. I remember I had a little exercise we would use sometimes that, that led to my favorite bit ever on any of the roasts. And, and I would say, we'd be there late at night, and I'd say, if it was the movie of the Bob Saget roast, okay? If we were watching the movie, what's the, it, what would be the thing that someone got up at the roast? What would be the most awful, dramatic, nightmarish thing to be revealed, okay? So, like, like this, let's, let's not think of it as a comedy. Let's think of this as a drama, okay? First right. up. And so... And so I'm with another writer, Chris McGuire, and I say, like, it'd be like Gilbert Gottfried getting up and revealing, saying, like, Bob Saget killed a girl in 1990, right? right. And the gasp goes through the crowd, and he reveals. And then we're laughing so hard at the idea of Gilbert exposing the murder that he committed in his past, you know? Right. And, the, and, and so now we're really dying, which then uh, became a like a big first amendment lawsuit a couple years later um because a guy did a whole website saying glenn beck uh, uh killed a girl in 1990 <laughs> and th 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 using the same template of like right. now i can't prove this you, you know which turned into a whole first amendment case you know God. but but i but that idea of like what's the yes when you're saying like what's true what's what's weird what's offset yes that will always be funny patrice o'neill was one of the greatest at that and and he was one of the guys i saw get up like at the shatner roast without like one-liner jokes who was ho absolutely hilarious just speaking the truth about what was going on in the people there right you know so in that case you're you're pretending that that is a truth, and I'm just trying to break down the, the why that's funny. So I you're, think it's, because well, it's so absurd. Well, it's that... it's funny. Yes, there's there's two things there. That, the, I mean, in that case, it's funny because that's not really speaking to a truth. In that case, I think what was what's was funny about it was us going. It's almost the other thing. It's like, um, what's the thing with comedy? It's it's either like I'm speaking this deep truth. Or what's the thing I would least expect to hear right now? It's That's surprise. It. That's it. And if you can combine those two, if you can surprise someone with a truth that you wouldn't expect to be said out loud, that's the best. That's right. the best of both. Right. You know? I used but. to feel bad that Gilbert Gottfried lost his uh, Aflac gig because of his tweet about the, <laughs> oh the tsunami in Japan. But, you know, now maybe he deserved it. He he was the absolute best to write for. He was my favorite. And he would come in and he was... Did you ever meet him? Did you I meet never him met him. The, he was so like sweet and soft-spoken. 
and you would write his set, you know, and he'd come in and he'd want to read through the jokes and everybody would gather, you know, and he'd sit around, he'd read through jokes and he'd be sitting there with this script going like, uh, I just want to say Kathy Griffin is the biggest cunt who ever <laughs> like he'd be, he'd be reading these horrible, horrible things, but in this soft voice. Right. And another thing wrecked him. I nearly killed him. Right. You know, and then he'd go out there and do this screaming at the top of his lungs. Right. You know, he, he was, uh, he was, he was my absolute favorite to write for. Rest in peace. Gilbert yeah. Copper. He was the greatest. And we'll be back after this. We've hit the streets of America to demonstrate the effectiveness of new Dristex BM nasal decongestant. Sure. On a clear sinus day, Fred Johnson has no trouble identifying the scent of his faithful companion. But today, he can't smell a thing. I can't smell a thing. Now he's trying new Dristex BM. Dristex works as it penetrates to leave you breathing comfortably in seconds. Ah, oh, it's Max's stool. New Dristex BM, because you never want to miss what's right under your nose. All right, we're back. Aaron, thanks for coming by. So this is my cool office. It's an extremely cool office. Thank you, yeah. yeah. Are you living in this office? Do you, are you actually living here? No. You know, no, okay. If things get bad, maybe. Okay. Um, but knock wood, you know, all good. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah, life has just kind of brought me back out here. I, I feel good. I went home to Virginia for a long time, took care of some family business, and now I'm I'm here ready to do funny stuff, and you're my first oh guest. Oh, my God. And I'm, what an I'm honor. I'm thrilled to have you here. Yeah, what an honor. Yeah, because you always crack me up, and you always sort of dodge when I say, hey, Aaron, do you want to write this thing with me? You're like, yeah, 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 let me get back to you. And I'll, yeah. <laughs> That's and not true. like, Aaron doesn't want to fucking do that. That's not true. Yeah, That's well, one day. Ridiculous. Yeah, no you. kidding. Yeah, uh, you you wrote all sorts of funny stuff while you were back there. Yeah, yeah, I worked on stuff. I, I was I was working in a vacuum. I was in Richmond, Virginia, my hometown. You know, just getting one of my kids through high school and the other one ready to move out here and um, and spending time. You know, spending family time and it was great. But mm -hmm. creatively, you know, I wrote a pilot, I shot it, I financed it, starred in it, directed it, all mm -hmm. that stuff. And, and it was all, great. Almost sold it. Well, thank you. Yeah, I uh, saw it. Yeah, thank you. And um, could have been better if you'd helped me. But um, I'm totally kidding. I did help I you. You did. You I did. did. No, you did yeah. very much. Yeah, um, yeah. And um, yeah, and I wrote another movie that I haven't told you about. But no. I'll, I'll tell you about that at some point. I don't want to. Okay. I don't want to give away any secrets right now. What do you um, want to do while you're back here? I want to make you, I want to make an independent movie. Yeah, I want to do there this. You go. I want to talk to my friends about comedy and life, and I want to make a movie. And, yeah. And um, I you know I don't want to go through the system. I want to make what I want to make, and I I can do that. I know enough people with cameras and things. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, and got some friends with some some coin, as we used to say. Yeah, I just got some coin, and um, you know, just working. I want it to be just the right tone because I, I want it to be funny but also kind of nice who's who's your favorite who's your idol who would you you know who'd you look at and go Gosh. is it this guy is um, it lynch is it who david lynch makes some great movies you know he yeah. he is just wacky you don't know what to expect there's yep. humor there's sex there's intrigue tension mm -hmm. the violence i can do without myself um but yeah, you know, back in the day, Chevy Chase would light it up, you know, all improvised. Steve mm -hmm. Martin would be highly meticulous in his preparation, from what I've heard. Right. <clears throat> but comedy gold. So I kind of just, I sort of weave those guys. But honestly, I meditate. I like to chill out. I like yeah. to let, let thoughts come. I love that Rick Rubin book. Do you have that? No, the, uh, no. The Creative Act. I highly it's recommend really good. that to okay. anyone, uh, particularly an audio book. It's just about having your antenna up and catching ideas, basically. David mm -hmm. Lynch preaches the same thing. Yeah. Um, uh, How long have you been meditating? Uh, about 10 years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember talking to you about that back in the Cleveland yeah, show. TM. Cause yeah, TM. Because I think that's when I started. Yes, it is. Yeah, and, yeah. and Goldie and I, J Julius Goldie Sharp, yes. uh, had a... Um, office together we would meditate on our lunch breaks right our right and i haven't meditated today and i i usually do it every morning and i was so okay yeah well maybe you know what we got 20 minutes the next 20 minutes let's go i can only i was just thinking of what your mantra would be 
No. That it'd be. No, you never know. <laughs> no, but that's a great way to catch ideas. And, and I get kids, you know, friends will call me, hey, my kid really wants to be creative for a living, wants to write, wants to act, this, that, or the other. And I really focus with them on the process of just enjoying mm-hmm. what you do. Because mm-hmm. if you're working toward an outcome, you never know what's going to happen. And, you know, that if you're always looking to the future, you can't enjoy where you are. Hey, you know what's funny about having this conversation right now? What? You were talking about the Rick Rubin book. Yes. I got recommended to me this book, The Artist's Way. Julia Cameron. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now see, I always thought, for, I always was like kind of dismissive of that book. All I knew was like, oh, I think it's like this book for frustrated artists. And uh, and I kind of thought it was like, uh, like a... Uh, self help book, yoga mom book, right? Yeah. Like, and and I was like dismissive, and I I, I didn't think there was anything wrong with that, but I I didn't think like, oh, this would be this. I should do that. And a friend recommended it to me. I'm on week eight, mm-hmm. and it's blowing my mind. So you basically get up in the morning and you write long yes. for three pages, yep. and you don't read it. And yep. you put it away. You do that every day for I, I what I would say is you do it every day for a month. So you did it. And you then did you the go book back too. and you read it. Yeah. Day one, it's like brain dump. It's like, all right, I just woke up. I'm tired as shit. I hope I get something out of this. I got to mm-hmm. take my kid to school. I got to take a crap. All right. Back from taking a crap. This coffee sure is. And, and, and it's just or anything. Blah, blah, blah. It's just yeah. like really just right. First thing in the morning. Right. right. And then like I see in my mind a vision of a man walking down the street in the rain. And okay, and then I got to take out the trash and I got to pay this bill, you know, just all that shit. But by the 30th day, you've written a story, you're you're writing a story about the man walking down the street in the rain and where he came Mm -hmm. from. And like whatever that creative idea is, you're not putting your post-it notes on the page anymore. You're you're you've cut to the chase. Did you do all 12 weeks? No, I've never made it that long. Okay, like like I said, I'm on week eight. So we'll see if I get through the next four. Yeah. Now, are you, you know, not not to get into the details of it, but are is, are you actually writing a project this way? Is it, are you on No, tra- not okay. really, not really. You're writing about life or like, Yeah, okay. yes, it's been, yeah, it's been, I kind of say like, especially when I'm talking about like my incredibly messed up past, it, not just Hustler Magazine, which I had to do all this stuff to get over, but when you were talking about dysfunctional families, all the stuff that all comedy people have in common, okay. it's, it's yeah. who we are, where we come from. But um, so I've done all sorts of therapy, all sorts of recovery stuff. All You know, I've done tons of this kind of stuff. Uh, I got to say, this is one of the most powerful things like that I think I've done because um, because to sit and do those pages that you're talking about and it's it's not a project it's just like it, it's been it's been more kind of intense and powerful to me than any therapist i ever talked to because it is it's so unfiltered mm-hmm. like i mean whatever damage there is from my past i can just go <laughs> man yeah. you can just put it out you can just put it all out there you're not having any concern about any kind of judgment or i'm working with my thoughts are what you think about this it's been amazing it's been really good. So the artist way is great. I've got another book here that really I, I have found <laughs> helpful. Um, it's, it's, it's the big book of pussy. And, um, you know, if I ever just want to look at, at pussies. I'm scandalized now. Joke. See, at age 52, I'm scandalized seeing such a thing. At, at, at 20, that's that was my whole career. All right, all now right. I'm. I'm I'm shocked. I'm shocked and dismayed. We were getting too deep, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, no, I understand. So, I understand. So I wanted to get just <laughs> deep enough. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's fun. All right. What's the best drug you ever did? Love. <laughs> Love uh, is no. the drug. Um, said Roxy Music. Uh, the best drug I ever did. Uh, you know, probably shrooms. I mean, I, yeah. Was know, it? My, Sarah and I went. Like I said, we saw you two at the Sphere and had, oh, had just and the right were, amount. And oh wow! It was amazing. It was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. But I yeah. think every time I do those, I've, I'm feeling pretty real and yeah, and pretty, you know, pretty free. I never, I never did shrooms, but oh. I did do ecstasy, and I thought it was the best. I did. It, I think I did it one or two times, and then I was like, I this is, I can't. I'll just do this every day. 
So right. I can never do it again. Right. You know what I mean? You get that thing where you're like, well, that was so great. Why wouldn't I just do this every day of my life? Right. Like when I weighed, uh, you know, 60 pounds more than this, I used to have a milkshake with every meal pretty much because oh. because I felt like it was good. Milkshakes are so fucking good. Why wouldn't you have one with dinner every yeah. night? Yep. Of course. Yeah. You go to a restaurant, they have milkshakes, you order the milkshake. So I, I have that. That that's that makes me a little scared of drugs, honestly. I think that's wise. Yeah, it's wisdom talking. So yeah. yeah, I mean, I I um, I've dropped some weight as well, and I just it's so it's it's so mental. I mean, any any food craving is mental. If unless you haven't eaten for days, <laughs> you're not going to fucking starve. Well, that was a big part of my me losing weight. Was a guy said to me, a guy who was not from the United States. He said. He said, Americans have no idea what hunger is. They, the Americans, it, like he's, he said to me, he's like, you've never been hungry. Yeah. So you don't know what it is. So you have the slightest, he's like, you get the slightest awareness of your body because you go, oh, I could kind of eat. And you freak out and go, must numb feelings with milkshake. Right. <laughs> you know, like as a, he, and he was like, hunger is actually like a pain in your body. Yeah. If you get actually hungry. And that philosophically did help me. Like yeah. when I'd go like, oh, I'm kind of hungry right now. I'd go like, I'm not actually hungry. Yeah. It's I'd mental. like to eat <laughs> to mental. not feel things. That's it. Yeah, well, did yeah. he know that an American wrote that song? I'm getting hungry. <laughs> I, you know, th th that song is wrong. The guy's not getting hungry. He's yeah. an American. He can't possibly. Yes, exactly. Be. He doesn't know. What yes. Jeez. Yeah. God, Americans. But Americans bought the music, so it became a hit because That's they were true. all hungry. Well, they yeah, they thought they were. Yeah, yeah they thought they were. All right, good. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's your day to day like these days? Um, uh, well, it's been <laughs> months of nothing because of the strike. It's mm -hmm. been months of marching around in mm -hmm. the writer's strike, mm -hmm. and uh, and then I had two movies that uh, I sold before the strike that the past that we got into and then we had to stop everything and then the past couple of weeks have been furiously writing on these couple, oh wow couple movie projects. well i appreciate yeah. you taking a break from that uh, of course of course yeah doing that um and and then and it's and it's great things starting to kind of start up again uh so you know um so like tomorrow i'm gonna go hang out with friends who uh, do the new Beavis and Butthead oh, nice. and goof around with them for a day and do a round table with them. And that'll be the first time I've been in a comedy writing room oh, for that's great. eight months or something. That's great. You know what I mean? So it's does the your best. agent get you this stuff or do you just have your buddies and they say, we got to that, have Aaron? That's buddies. Yeah. You know, that, and talking to the agents again. And, and I don't know about you, but like um, that thing of being in a comedy writing room is just the best. And... We went through two years of COVID of all Zoom rooms, which mm -hmm. I hated. Yeah. It's it just the worst. And I remember the um, the first in-person room. You don't I, know who's listening. Like there's a, a liberty in the- You don't know who's recording. Yes, who's listening. In a comedy room, it's oh kind of like we're all on the same page. It's a safe space to push the envelope. But when you're on a Zoom, <laughs> who's listening? Who's recording? You're who's going to hear this out of context? This with, clip. With a bunch of people sitting, these like flat faces just staring at you. Mm -hmm. If 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 everybody's to, going like this, t totally yes. Yeah. People are texting out of frame, you know. And um, oh my god! And I ran a show during Zoom for Netflix, and that was really hard. Like, because you just have like eight faces just staring at you. Like, what you know? What do we do, boss? What do you want? Yes, exactly. And um. And when I got, and here's the other thing, Zoom, if people do laugh, Zoom compresses the volume. <laughs> right. So the laugh is to, so the first. That's in, so funny. It's so yeah. anti-comedy. Yeah. And the first um, in-person room I went to actually was TED, speaking of, it mm -hmm. was for the TED. And I went in the room and there's like, I don't know, like 14 people there. And the first joke I said that got a big laugh I literally like jumped out of my seat, like holy fucking shit! Right, what's it happening? felt like I was at Madison Square Garden, or I was like nice. Andrew Dice Clay in 1988 or something. You know, like it was so great. But here's the thing: I I have noticed about going back to in-person rooms that you're talking about, like oh, we're all in the same. It took me 
uh, a couple weeks to get comfortable with like seeing reactions out of the corner of my eye again. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like everything is so like, you know, it's, it's hard reading because expressions in the room with well, you're people. afraid you're going to lose everything now. Yeah. Like you yeah. really are like back in the day. I remember like just pitching whatever. You know, just absolutely whatever. Like, sure. The, the wor- you know, the worst things you could say that are funny. <laughs> sure. But, yes. you know, and a lot of them went on TV back then. <laughs> yes. But now it's true. like you get you have a level of, of success and a family and everything else. You don't want to you don't want to lose it all. Yeah. And I mean, and it's like and I genuinely do believe I genuinely do believe there's good and bad things about that. Mm-hmm. Like that that freedom. Yes, <laughs> man. I, I watched this is the example everybody brings up. I know it's like a cliche example at this point, but my daughters had never seen blazing saddles. Mm -hmm. Right. So we watched blazing Saddles for the first time and they were losing their fucking minds. You you know what I mean? Like in what way in, in uh, it's such unbridled comedy, loving it and laughing so hard, but being shocked at what they're hearing. And, and me rewatching that movie because that always comes up as the example yeah. i feel like of people going you can never do blazing saddles now right and the thing that you don't think until you rewatch the movie that hit me i was like the relationship between cleavon little and gene wilder is so sweet and funny and beautiful and they seem to really love each other you know what i mean and that creates the safety you were talking about earlier that that makes all the beyond the pale jokes okay right you, you know what i mean and you're totally on their side and um and so i do think that's missing now on the other hand i think you got to be in a good way sometimes you got to be more disciplined you you got to i i have found myself going in going like okay uh yeah i can't just free associate so there's a target and i really gotta hit it and i really gotta find what's true like you're saying i i can't i've got to really find i got eight people in here and you got to find a truth that um it's it's a different discipline in a way and i think it's good and i I do think it's good so it's not a preaching to the choir thing where you know everybody's sort of gonna laugh at the same thing you have to you have to be inventive and find something yeah. that's going to be funny to most people. Yes. And, and, and I do think, and I do think, um, and that's the interesting thing. Like things were so tense during COVID mm-hmm. during the Trump years leading up to January 6th. I do. I don't know about you, but I do. Th- I think people want to laugh again. I think people want think to have so. a good time. You, I really I'm, do. I'm glad we're having this conversation because I have been mostly just frustrated by not being able to, say whatever but i but i'm i'm glad to to hear this because there is a a sensitivity that needs to to be out there but at the same time it's been pushed too far toward that you know i think everyone (laughs) any comic would agree that you ought to be able to say whatever's funny and and not have a crowd wondering whether it's okay to laugh at something or not you Mm -hmm. know like you it's if something is instinctively funny you put it out there and you get the laugh and then you live with the praise or the consequence. <laughs> like mm-hmm. it's the same kind of thing. Like I've, uh, you know, I got in trouble all the time at school because I would imitate teachers or fart in class or, you know, do whatever because I just lived to make everyone laugh. Right. So yes, I got the laugh, but then I also got the consequence or I'd be staying after school for a while. So you right. have to learn that, you know, as you go. And I think society, and as you're saying, it was easier to be funny when Obama was president because not everyone you know not not 60 percent of the country felt like shit uh yeah right like they were they were not you know spoken for they were not you know uh represented right or whatever so so i get that it's interesting so yeah i'm i'm telling you i think i think like it's just like you gotta okay uh, here here's what i want to say uh you go through all of covid couldn't go to movie theaters and then I remember the first comedy movie I saw in a theater after COVID, or it's kind of still going on, but was the Jackass movie, mm-hmm. the last Jackass movie. And I go and it's like opening night and it's sold out. Maybe there's like a hundred people there and they're losing their fucking shit. They're dying laughing. And it, and it was this thing where I was like, 
oh my God, even before COVID, it's been years since I sat in a theater with that many people laughing really mm -hmm. hard. You know what I mean? Because yeah. people stopped kind of going to comedies. You know, yeah. it's been a long time. And it was such a such a great cathartic experience that it, of the dumbest shit you can possibly do. Yeah. Which is punch Johnny Knoxville in the nuts. Well, the, you know? The brilliance of that is that any idiot could do it if they would yes. do it. <laughs> yeah, yes. And and that made me feel like, oh, I hope like and the movie did well and I go like I hope this reminds people like oh it is fun to laugh at things together yeah. it is fun to go and have a good time yeah you know so yeah. yeah fuck you know if you would only sit down with me and write something I think we could do it <laughs> well, um, let's fucking start right now I'm gonna bounce some shit off you man let's, I got let's some start stuff. writing right now right. Get, get your laptop come all on right. let's go all right they, uh, these people can see the process that's right <laughs> see God, that would be the, brutal the sausage is made yeah well well, <laughs> that was that was another career for you. <laughs> yes, yes, it was. Um, yeah. Well, I think maybe we're winding down. Is there anything right. else you want to touch on? Oh, the the TED TV show. So that's coming out what in January? I think I don't it's. Even know. Is I it? Is it to January? Se yeah, I, it, it's coming out in January on Paramount Plus. Is that right? No, Peacock. Oh, Peacock. Yes, Sorry, Peacock. Yeah. yeah. So uh, how dare you, Peacock? That's. <laughs> two funny words right there see they, um, you can't miss i'm in that i have a i have a i have a guest star on oh, the, no, uh, wait. the ted tv show no it's on pistic it's pistic it's oh, it's not pistic. yes it's pistic okay. that's what it's on that's yeah. fine yes, yeah, yeah as yeah. long as you know it has to do with urine and no, a penis no urine it's urine wing that's the, okay it's on urine wing yeah it's like I'm a sorry. kentucky I, fried movie there's so many of these streamers get it streamers i get you it like that you're on yeah. fucking fire uh, man. i just i figured at the end Saying all that serious shit. Just yeah. Trying yeah. I'm just going to wait for the shake here. <laughs> we'll be done. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, Kentucky Fried Movie. Saw the um, the Zucker Brothers and Jim Abrams recently with John Viner. We went and went to a book signing so cool. for their airplane book. And um, so I rewatched some of Kentucky Fried Movie recently. And it's, it's pretty fucking funny and very fucking offensive by today's standards. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. insane. It's like the, the, they do the... Uh, the uh, Bruce Lee parody, uh, starring uh, oh, Long yeah. Hung Well <laughs> yes. as so and so Long yeah. Wang, fistful of yen and enormous genitals. <laughs> like those are the three guys' names. Oh my god! Uh, yeah, fistful of yen. You know, one of the movies I'm writing right now it is a parody movie. Is a very old school Zucker style. That's really, one of the things that we sold before, right. and I gotta say, it is so fun. It's so fun to just write that shit. It's when the most fun thing. When in you're the doing world. punch up, call me. Yeah, please. Uh, yes, yeah. That hopefully that'll be soon. And hopefully if you're doing munch up, <laughs> well, call me. Well, uh, yeah. You there you go. <laughs> <laughs> the big book of pussy. Again, that's what I'm promoting here. Yeah, please. Yep. Everybody buy my book. Aaron Lee, <laughs> this is Mike Henry. Thank you very much for coming in. And yeah, um, man, thanks for the you know, invite. Everybody, run out and get this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks, Aaron. I love that. That's what you ended up promoting. Yeah, why not?